the user. Host could be any computer, could be server or a client. So end device is a client. So servers, servers are computers here. Today we're going to start our journey and uh, I'm going to explain you many topics preparing you for the exam of CCNA to the successful web. So our topic today will include certain subjects. Role and function of network components, characteristics of network topology architectures and comparing physical interfaces with the cabling types as well as interface, how you can identify interface and cable issues, which includes collision, error, mismatch, duplex, or and speed. Of course, at the end of our first um, subject, we'll be comparing TCP and UDP protocols. Let's start. So networking today. As you may know, there is a various network today and uh, those networks could be a complicated, could be a easy created networks, but we should know what those networks are and how they create it. So, in the network environment, there is a host and server role. How we can explain that? So here on the presentation which I prepare for you, we have a client and we have a server. So what is a client? Or we call it also um, end device or host. So client could be any computer which is behind the client is the user. Host could be any computer, could be server or a client. So end device is a client. So servers servers are computers here computers which are providing services so for computers which are giving us services those we call it server for example email server web server file server dns server and active directory servers those are servers client for other uh, from other hand is a um, computers which are consuming those services. That's why we call it client. Peer-to-peer -peer role. Still we are um, in the position of the network component. Peer-to-peer -peer role is possible to have a device be a client and the server in peer-to-peer -peer communication. Why? Because peer-to-peer -peer communication is not centralized is not secure because every single computer is taking care about its own security and about its own administration. Low cost, of course, because we are not creating a complex network and slow performance, slow performance because it's one network, one to one, so node to node, host or client to server. So that's why these networks are not preferred really in large businesses. So these networks you can establish at home or a very small offices, which possibly could this network be benefit, beneficial. End device. We talk about again that end device is a computer which behind that computer is the user. So as you can see here we have end device in this network and we have end devices in that network. So device, end device is again is the computer behind. After it or behind that computer is the user. So as you can see here 
as you can see here, we have a LAN, we have another LAN, and between the LAN, we have internet. So, this is your internet or the network itself. This internetwork allows all end devices to communicate to each other. So, if one end device send the message to this end device, it will go through the internet network. So, in this internet network, if we go back here, in this internet network, we have many devices. We call them network devices. Those network devices, we're going to talk a little bit more further. We're going to point those network devices that they are LAN switches, routers, multi-layer switches, and wireless router, as well as firewall appliances. So I would like to point here that we're going to talk about LAN switches, or just a switch, and routers, because those are core um, intermediary devices in any network. Of course, there is a wireless router, but the principle for all those devices are the same. Multi-layer switch is uh, not more than a switch with router capabilities. Here we call it layer 3 switch. Okay. Firewall appliances is a firewall, um, firewall device which is dedicated to be a firewall. What we know about the firewall? That it's uh, filtering the incoming and outgoing traffic. Always, guys, remember that. Uh, firewall or any securing device must, good securing device, must filter by any measurement incoming and outgoing traffic. So, intermediary devices, router and switches and the others. So, example, we see here in the picture, what they do. They manage a data, they redistribute a data, regenerate and retransmit the data signal, maintain the information about what paths exist in the network. We're going to talk about that. This is the uh, key function of the router. What paths are existing in the network and which is the best path for the router to forward the package. And notify the other devices of error or communication failures. Now, network media. As you know, computers, network devices, they are connected somehow, right? Those devices, they need the communication media. Media in this case is um, cables or um, wireless, fiber optics, right? Um, also, um, yeah, we could stand with those three for now. So cables, which is wired, copper cables, wireless, fiber optics, and what those cables are made of. So media types, so metal wires with in a cable, so use electrical pulses. So those are cables here. We're going to talk about more um, in details later. Glass and fiber optics cables are here. And wireless transmission. Now, those wired cables use electrical impulses. What's the core of these cables? It's um, metal. It's called copper. So it's a, a conductor. So it's very good conductor. So it's provided electrical impulses. So this cable is actually carrying out data. And um, all cables which are connecting our computer into the network, it's made it by copper core. There is a uh, many uh, different cables which you can create from the um, copper cables, 
We're going to talk about that later. So fiber optics, just few words, keywords, or a few important things that uh, I can say about the fiber optics. That fiber optic is a high transmissible cable. It's high bandwidth. It's um, uh, it's very efficient cable. Why? Because the core of the fiber optics is made from glass. And what's the carrier of the signal? It's a light pulse. Wireless, wireless transmission is made by wireless network or radio waves. Radio waves, you know, they have frequency, um, some frequency, they are better transmitting than another frequency. But that, that's why we have different wireless standards. We're going to talk about those standards later as well. So, network representation and topologies. As you know, network represents itself in the world. Uh, there are different networks uh, and they must somehow connect to each other. As well as a certain organization at the beginning, when the internet was created, they decide to do certain rules and topologies how the network must be constructed. Again, here, just to remind you. Okay, here, the network representation. We have N devices in the network representation. We have uh, intermediate dev devices. We already talked about it. And we have a uh, network media. So, N devices, they are forming by desktops, laptops, printers, iPhones, IP phones, wireless tablets, te uh, telepresence, and endpoint. But the most important thing is, as I already explained, end device is everything which stays behind that end device is the user. So your phone, if you connect your phone to the wireless, your phone became an end device. But if you provide using the hotspot from your mobile phone, another person then your phone became an intermediary device so intermediary device here is a wireless router LAN switch router multi-layer switch as we already talked about it's a layer 3 switch which has a uh, router capabilities and firewall appliances here as well network medium it's created by wireless transmission LAN media which is actually our copper cable or um, fiber optics cable but mostly copper cable and one media one media is created by fiber optics or serial cables we will talk about that as well so what is important guys to know in terms we are using in the networking network interface card basically every device if the device needs to be connected within the network, it needs network interface card. Without it, the device cannot be present in the network. Then also, physical port and interface. Physical port is exactly the physical place where the cable it gets into the device. The interface is the logical abbreviation logical abbreviation of that physical port logical for example LAN switch has six ports right or more those are physical ports but those ports has a logical abbreviation or we call it interfaces S1 S2 S3 S4 so those are interfaces. On the logical map, those interfaces are there. Okay. Often the terms port and interface are used interchangeably. Topology diagrams, guys. 
So here we have a two types of diagrams and two types of topology. Physical topology, as you can see here, it's adjusted devices, but here we're talking about representation of those devices on the network map. To know exactly those devices, how, are, how they're standing in the network, we need a topology. So any network administrator, any network administrator who is running a network department, it needs the topology, physical and logical topology, just to know its own network. And it's better for troubleshooting. That's every single administrator, every single technician needs to know where is located any device and what's the logical information about that device, IP addresses, port numbers, and etc. So here we have a two parts, two topologies. One is a physical one from the left side and from the right side is the logical one. So physical one, uh, physical topology. What is interesting, uh, interesting for physical topology is that it's basically give you the information of the location and physical part of the service. As you know, <clears throat> Servers or any network equipment in large companies, they are placed in uh, specific IT rooms. Those IT rooms has uh, IT racks. IT racks, they have uh, many shelves. And all network equipment, servers, they are rack mounted. So you can mount them in those shelves. And those shelves can be hundreds, thousands. So you, you should know the exact location of your device. Well, as you can see here, which is, so, uh, which is really nice, and you can really navigate, quickly navigate and troubleshoot your network environment just by looking, locate your network device just by looking on that topology. So here is your network structure. The same network structure is valid for both. But what we have here, we have a server room. So we have a physical location of all devices in this network. Then after, you have a rack 2, shelf 1, and the description of this machine. And this machine description is web server, right? Then you have an email server on the rack 2 and shelf 2. Of course, this is not just a document. On the machine itself, you must have also tags. Tags are those little stickers or marks which are exactly the same as on the map. On the right side, you have a logical topology. Logical topology is completely opposite. It gives you the logical description of all network. First, Every computer, so every server, every network equipment has IP address and port interface where it's connected to the network. So here we have this network, right? In this network, which is the same on the left side, as you can see, the, the map doesn't change. We keep it the purpose, the description of the server. But now we are know which interface, you know, it's a physical port, is connected to the network and its logical abbreviation, which is F01. That's the tag, that's the name, that's the mark of the interface of this web server. And of course, the network address of the entire network. Of course, you can also put the, every single IP address of every single interface, but map will be really detailed and sometimes it's not necessary. It's going to be too complicated to read that map. And what is most important, the core router, which is forming this um, network and its default gateway, has also all interfaces visible how they connected to the internal network or to the internet.
Now, common types of networks. Networks has many sizes. We have networks at home. We have networks of small businesses. We have networks in very large corporations. But how we call them? And what's, what it means in terms of network? So, small home or any one of us which is placing at home, we have a, a, we're having a small network. And we call it small network. Then we have a, a little bit larger network, but still small as a company, and we call it Soho. Small office, home office. Then we are moving forward, having a medium or large companies, which are small building or medium-sized building or really big building, skyscraper. And then we have a worldwide. The entire world of all communication channels and all computers, right? So small office connect a few computers. Enables a computer within a home or remote office to connect the corporate network. The medium to large networks, many location with hundreds or thousands of interconnected computers. So for example, we having a headquarters in Montreal. Then we're having the headquarters, another headquarters in Toronto and another one in Vancouver. All these three buildings are communicating between each other with one big large corporate network. And there is a thousand thousands computer inside that building. So that's called a medium and large network size. Lance and once. Now, how is path of connecting and device to the network and how the data is going from one device to another device for source to the destination it's always a two parties source and destination right so first we're having a computer connecting to an internal network called LAN right then we having a LAN connected to a WAN, which is actually our internet. There is a, a little bit uh, a more small variation inside before we get into the WAN, but we're not going to discuss today. We're going to discuss that in different uh, with different subject. So network infrastructure vary greatly in terms of size of the area is covered. Number of users connected, number and types of services available, and area of responsibility. So LAN, local area network, is basically your building. So the ge geographical location for this is limited to a building, small building, big building, large building, but still a building, the LAN, local area network. One is a wide area network. It's uh, if you are trying to connect, for example, Toronto head office with the Montreal or Vancouver head office buildings. So it's a city to city, country to country, or continent to continent. That is your one connection. So um, what does do like? LAN interconnects and devices. So every single computer inside the LAN, every single server, every single switch, every single router, it connects all end users, all computers together. So administered by a single organization or individual. Of course, if you're running an active directory in that company, all computers will be authorized, administered, uh, secure by one server, one domain controller. But this is a different subject. We're going. We're not going to talk about that. So, provide a high-speed bandwidth to internal devices. Because of the high-speed bandwidth of the internal devices, your LAN network is very fast. One interconnects LANs together, or um, 
before one there is a, another uh, another types of network which are MAN which is metropolitan area network and exactly those networks are connecting LANs together but MAN is the part of one which means white area network that's why they directly here is telling us that one is interconnect slum over the wide geographical area but you have to keep you have to keep in mind inside the one we're having a man metropolitan area network so metropolitan area network connects one lands together local area networks together one area network connects cities countries and countries Internet at the end, right? So the big internet, the invisible internet. So internet is a worldwide collection of interconnected LANs and WANs. Basically, is the entire world. So LANs are connected to each other using WANs. WANs may use copper wires, fiber optic cables, wireless transmission. It doesn't matter which cable is is depends on the. Um, the owner of the company or a person who wants to create that network but those are variation wires fiber optics cables and wireless transmission so the internet because it's growing every day every minute every second is in uh, is owned is not owned by any individual is not the private is not owned by any private company but is regulated by non-profit public organization so those organizations are IETF ICANN and IAB so those different organizations are responsible for the different regions some of them are North America some of them are uh, responsible for the Europe and some of them for Australia New Zealand and etc but those organizations they are responsible for ruling and helping maintain the structure of the internet. Now, internet connections. Home and small office internet connection. So we're having here a small and home office. First, how we can create a small and home office what you have at home you have a modem right you have an isp provider internet service provider which provides you an internet right so you are uh, accepting that internet through the modem then from the modem you're connecting your modem with the cable to your wireless router and from wireless router you redistributing the signal inside your home so cable, we should know. What are the types of getting the internet to your home or be connected to the network? So cable, high bandwidth, always on. Internet offered by cable television services providers. It could be any cable provider, which is licensed to operate in your country. DSL is a different type of connection. It's a high bandwidth, again, always on, internet connection that runs over a telephone line. So you must have a telephone line. So it's provided by telecommunication provider. So telephone line. And over this telephone line, you're going to receive an internet or connection to the network, worldwide network. Cellular. Use a cell phone network to connect to the internet, right? So it's your mobile phones, guys. So ladies and gentlemen, here we are using daily those mobile phones and we are using daily this cellular network. Satellite, which not, uh, we not use that often, that network. Maybe some of us never used it before. Why? Because satellite uh, network is given only in rare occasions when we don't have a network around it. For example, inhabited area like a desert, like an um, Amazonian forest. Somewhere there is no uh, technological advancement and we cannot um, 
use our telecommunication channels. And at the end, dial up telephone is the legacy already. There is not in use anymore. But at the beginning, when the internet was provided, we use a telephone line and dial up Business. This, what we thought was about the home office, but business is using a little bit, a little bit different type of connection. Dedicated lease line. Very expensive. Why? Because it's dedicated exactly for that company. So basically, it's uh, they build it point-to-point -point connection and they put between them a dedicated cable. It could be a fiber optic or any other transmission cable. And this cable is dedicated for this company. And as well as the speed is guaranteed. That's why this line is very, very much expensive. Ethernet 1. This Extend your current LAN access technology into a one wide area network. DSL. Business DSL is available in various formats, including symmetric digital, symmetric digital subscriber line. DSL. DSL is the business DSL line, is available in various formats including symmetric digital subscriber line, SDSL. And at the end, again, is a satellite. Actually, the satellite is mostly used by companies because they can afford it. Because directly the signal of the internet is coming from the satellite. So they need a dish, a special satellite dish, which is receiving the internet signal from the satellite. Reliable networks. What we need to have in our network in order to provide the security the resilience, we need the fault tolerance. What does it mean fault tolerance, guys? It means that if certain device is broken or certain path is off, still your data must be delivered at the destination. How it happens? It happens there is a many ways how the data can travel. So fault tolerant network limits the impact of a failure by limiting the number of affected devices. Multiple paths are required of fault tolerance. For example, as you can see, PC1. So one of the computer wants to send the message to another computer. So it will go through the switch, then it will go to the first router. Then, after that, it has choice. It needs to go to one router on the left or one router on the right. If the router on the left is not responsive or there is no response or the path is broken, so the router will choose another path to deliver the data. But the most important thing is we must have the multiput path to integrate the fault tolerance. Reliable network provides redundancy by implementing a packet switch network. So what does it mean that? So packet switch switching splits the traffic into the packets that are routed over the network and take different paths in event of breaking line or breaking a device itself. Scalability. Scalability is another uh, feature that we must have in our network. Why? Imagine that your company and you are uh, preparing your devices. So you are order a thousand computers, you order all network equipment, everything. But in the future, after one or two years, you see that your clients triple. It means three times more. Then you have choices. You have to get more equipment, hire more agents to serve 
your new three times more clients but if you not in advance whenever you create your network if you not put their scalability you're not going to be able to expand your network that's why it's called scalability so anytime you can extend and expanding your network so scalable network can expand quickly that's the keyword quickly and easily to support new users and application without impacting the performance and services of the existing users so as you can see here on the uh, picture we're having a network which recently has been added to an existing network we just uh, connected to the router network security as well so we must implement our network security by adding a firewalls the physical security of the network devices as you know that every network equipment or any equi uh, sorry any equipment is uh, behind the very secure doors with the physical access with the key key card then after you uh, you should have a, a keys of the racks to access the actual uh, devices and you must have a, also a logical security for providing uh, security from the hackers from the intrusion from outside such security are firewall appliances we're going to talk a little bit about topologies so topology of a network is arrangement and relationship of the network devices and interconnection between them so what kind again topology we already know is a physical and logical topology physical shows a physical connection where they are located which rack which room which shell logical topology identifies the virtual connection between devices using device interfaces and their IP addresses or you can uh, remember the schema which we saw uh, early in the slides which give you the interfaces the logical abbreviation of the interface for example for the router was FA0 and the IP address of the entire network there are three common physical one topologies point to point that's the smallest and most common one topology consists a permanent link between two endpoints I gave you the example before when two network connection uh, when two sites are connected to each other with a dedicated list line so they are using point-to-point -point connection hub and spoke similar to a start topology where central site interconnects branch sites through the point-to-point -point link and mesh, uh, mesh uh, one technology is provides high availability but requires every end system to be connected to every other end system so basically here we have a really good resilience and redundancy because every system is connected to each other and if one falls the another could provide the connection so what we have else it's a point to point one technology it's a physical point to point technology directly connected to nodes as we already talked about it the nodes may not share the media with other hosts so it means directly point one device to another point to another device the nodes may not share the media with other hosts because all frames on the media can only travel to or from two nodes point to point one protocols can be very simple LAN topologies and devices on the LANs are typically interconnected using a star or extended star topology so most efficient and most widely used uh, topologies now these days is a star topology and extended star here those two bus topology and ring topology they are legacy topology but still we talk about them because might be somewhere in the world they might still exist those topology for those countries who has history uh, in early days of the internet so bus topology all ends system chain together and terminate at each end but 
there is a gap here. If we break the line or we break the cable, it means the entire network go down. Here, it's valid the same. If we break the cable, the entire network goes down. As well, imagine that networks not go down. This network, it's a half duplex. It means first you're sending, the channel is busy. Then, if you want to receive, you must wait until the channel gets free. Then you receive the data. You cannot receive and send the data at the same time. So, how in that matters, because I already said full duplex, we're going to talk about the important stuff, which will basically on your exams. Half duplex and full duplex. What's the difference? So, half duplex allows one device to send or receive at the time of the shared meeting. One device sent or received. Use on WLAN, white local area networks, and legacy bus topologies with internet hubs. Full duplex allows both devices, means sending, receive, both devices to simultaneously transmit and receive on shared medium. Internet switches operate in full duplex mode. They are sending, they are receiving the data. That means full duplex. That is for this uh, section, which I already um, said about at the beginning. Now, the next subject, we will talk about comparing physical interfaces, cabling types, interface cable issues, and comparing TCP, IP, and UDP. So be with me, bear with me, and we'll see shortly. Hello again. So next topic in our uh, today's course is characteristics of physical interfaces and cabling types, which are part of the physical layer, as well as interfaces and cable issues, collision error mismatch duplex, and or speed, and comparing the TCP and UDP protocols. Physical layer, which stands on the physical of our devices. Physical layer characteristics. So physical layer in our OSI model, it stands at the beginning. It's the first layer of seven layers OSI model. What is there? Basically there is your cabling, your network cards, which are preparing the data to be transmitted through the medium. And medium is actually is our cables. So physical layer standards address three functional areas. Physical components, encoding, and signaling. The physical components are the hardware devices, media and other connectors that transmit the signal that represents the bits. Bits is the form of the information. It's a zeros and ones, right? It's a binary language. Which computers, by the way, they are communicated with the binary language. Now, bandwidth. This term means you must know very well what does it mean bandwidth. Bandwidth is the capacity, capacity at which a medium can carry the data. The bigger is the capacity, the more data you can transmit over the medium. The digital bandwidth measures uh, amount of data they can flow from one place to another at certain time of period. So we have unit of the bandwidth, bits per second, BPS. Then we have a kilobits per second, kbps, and mbps, which is megabits per second and gbps, which is gigabits per second. Bandwidth, kilobits per second, which we have in the abbreviation kbps, which is a thousand bits per second. One megabits per second, it forms a one million bits per second. Bandwidth, kilobits per second, which is a thousand 
bits per second, megabits per second, which is a 1 million bits per second. Bandwidth terminology. So we should know because those terminology will be in our uh, exams. So I would like you to prepare it. So those three terminology you must learn by heart. Latency is amount of time includes delay. Data travel from one point to another, including the returning back. Throughput is the measure of the transfer of bits across the media over a given time of period. And good put is the measure of usable data transfer over a given time of period. Now, because we talk about the physical layer, and on the physical layer it stays the network and the cable itself, the media through which we are sending our data, uh, uh, data and data is traveled across the globe. So, characteristic of the copper cabling. So, copper cabling is the most common types of cabling which we use to create our network. Inside the local area network, we use completely all and only a copper cabling. But if we talk about the large distances, there is a certain limitation of the copper cabling. So, attenuation. More is the distance of the cable, more the signal, electrical signal, is weaker. So that's why in the very large distances, in one wide area network, we're not using a copper cable. We're using a fiber optics. Also, the electrical signal is susceptible to the interfaces from two sources, which can distort or corrupt the data signal. One is EMI, which is electromagnetic interference, and RFI, which is radio frequency interference. Those cables are affected by that and the signal can be distorted. Mitigation. Mitigation strict adherence to the cable length limits will mitigate attenuation. Some kind of copper cabling mitigate EMI and RFI using metallic shielding. So some copper cabling they have a lot of shields inside to prevent this uh, distortion. For example, copper cable has a uh, rubber, then I have a plastic, very thick plastic uh, isolation, and um, they have a set a specific fans which is working as a Faraday cage, which uh, not allow the electrical and electromagnetic signal to distort the signal inside the cable. Type of copper cabling. We have a certain types as unshielded twisted pair types in this section. Then we have a shielded twisted pair types and we have a coaxial cable, right? In unshielded twisted pair types, UTP for short, we don't have a shielding. So those cables are not good to use if you know or if you have a really uh, big distortion sources like electromagnetic fields or radio frequency fields because they don't have shielding. The shielded twisted pairs, they have a shielding. As you can see, the shields are on each cable and of the whole set of twisted pair cables as well, we have shields. And coaxial cable is the most shielded cable. So we have, a, as a, I already said, we have a core, the copper core here, then we have a thick plastic insulation and we have a metal fence, which is preventing for the electromagnetic distortion to get in and destroy the signal. I'll show the twisted pair. It's a eight separated twisted pair cables, which are twisted by two. So it means we're having four groups of cable twisted by two and that cable is using to form our local area network. At the end of the cable we are terminating cable with RG45. RG45 is the connector which is getting into the cable and then we're using that connector to connect the cable into the network. Shielded twisted pair as I already mentioned it has a braided flow shield provides EMI and RFI protection, or we call it fans or Faraday cage 
and the same principle. We have an internal foil shielded to each pair, which also provide that protection. And at the end, we have color coded plastic insulation, electrical isolate the wire from each other. And at the end, the cable is uh, cable has an outer jacket. Provide the copper wire from physical damage. Coaxial cable. Coaxial cable consists of the following. So outer jacket, this is prevent from physical damage. Always we need uh, a outer jacket or rubber to prevent a physical damage. A woven bright and metallic foil acts as a second wire and circuit as a first. Then third one, a layer of flexible plastic insulation. And the fourth is actually our copper core. How we connect our connectors? We having a BNC N type and F type connectors. Most of them you probably already know, but for example, these cables. So there are different types of connectors to connect the copper cable or coaxial cable. So commonly used in the following situation: wireless installation. Attach antennas to wireless devices or cable, internet installation, customers' premises wiring. UTP cabling. So UTP cabling has four pairs and each pair is has color, right? So colors are orange, white orange, blue, white blue, green, white green, and brown, white brown. Depends how you are lining up those cables, you can create a two different types of cables. Let's talk about it. So, making a different standard type of cables, you're creating different type of cables. Those type of cables, we call it straightforward cables and crossover cables. UTP cables has four pairs by two cables and they are divided by color orange white orange blue white blue green white green and brown and white brown by variation of those cables you can create two types of cables which we're going to talk about a little bit later so standards for UTP are established by the organization and there is a standards for those cables cable types cable lengths connectors cable termination and testing method. So every cable, UTP cable, has a category. The higher is category, the more uh, beneficial is the cable. So less category is less beneficial is the cable. What's the benefits of the cable? Is the speed which is allowed to be transmitted to the cable, the distance which we allow to uh, running this cable to connect uh, devices or connect devices to the network and uh, the protection of the cable itself. Some of them they don't have protection, some of them they have protection. So categories are numbers. So number category number three, number four, number five, five E, six and etc. Seven and eight. To have these days, to have a um, functional network, you should have at least the category five E cable, which provides 100 megabits network, it's not shielded, but we don't need it because for LAN network, we're not using a shielded twisted pair cables. We are using unshielded twisted pair cables. So cable link and standard and connection here on the picture, you can see the connectors itself. So here is the termination, how we terminate our cable, what connector we put to our cable and this is RG45. RG45 socket, it looks like that on this picture. And you can see those sockets on the wall or on the routers, on the switches or on the racks. And here, how it look, use those connectors on the cable itself, how we connect it. So there is a proper termination of the connector and there is a not proper termination of the connector. On the top picture, you have a 
not proper termination of the connection. So the cables should not be loose here. Here is the proper termination of the connection. Now, because we talk about it uh, by lining up those colors, you can create different type of cables. Here is the color schema. So you can create two types of cables. One is a straight through cable and another is a crossover cable. So here is the schema of those cable or on their abbreviation, technical abbreviation is T568A and T568 568B. But what most important and you're going to have in your exam is the abbreviation of the cable itself, crossover or straight through. What does it mean those cables? So crossover cable is connecting the same devices, which means computer to computer, switch to switch, router to router. Same group of devices are connecting by the crossover cable. Different type of devices are connecting with straight through or somewhere where you can find as a straight forward cable. As well, there is a, another cable which called rollover cable is a proprietary of Cisco cable. Those cables are used only for connecting computer into a Cisco router or Cisco switch. The console cable, they call it a console cable. Now, the late, latest one which we are using these days is the fiber optics. Properties of the fiber optics not as common as UDP because of the expense involved. So it means the fiber optic is very expensive and it's used rarely and only in certain occasions. Ideal for some networking scenarios, transmit the data over longer distance. Here is the point. So we can use the fiber optic to transmit our data in wide area network where there is a lot of distances between the devices. Less susceptible to attenuation and completely immune for EMI or RFI. Why? Because the fiber optic carrier of the data is light impulse. It's not affected by MRI or RFI. Made of flexible, extremely thin strands of very pure glass. Use a laser or LED to encode the bits as pools of light. So one of them are more cheaper than others. That's why one fiber optic has a little bit much worse characteristic than other fiber optics. We're going to talk a little bit later about it. But that's why they use two types of source of light pulse. It's a LED or laser. Now, two types of fiber. Single mode fiber and multi mode fiber and they're using different types of light pulse source. So, single mode fiber here on the picture, very small core. Use expensive lasers. So, here we are using this cable in the large instances where the signal must be delivered with the same quality, long distance applications. In the multiple, uh, multi mode fiber, we are using a bigger core and we can use a much cheaper light sources like a LEDs. And as you can see here, we have the limitation of the speed and distance. For the left side, the single mode fiber, we almost don't have a limitation. There is limitation, but it's a very large amount of kilometers you can provide by single mode fiber optics. So fiber optics cabling now is used by four types of industry, enterprise network, fiber to the home, long haul networks, and submarine cable networks. Fiber optic connectors, you know, the cable, you have to connect that cable to the device and there is a few connectors to be terminated with the fiber optic. So it's a straight tip ST connector, loosened connector, let us see, and subscriber connector, SC or duplex, multi-mode LC connector. Depends on the type of 
device, you're using different type of connectors. Fiber patch cord is look exactly like that. So you have a SC, SC, MM patch cord, LC, LC, SM patch cord, STLC. So you see here in this cable, you have two different types of connectors, two different type patch cord. Or you have here ST to SC patch cord connectors. Bandwidth, UTP cabling, supporting 10 megabits to 10 gigabits, fiber optic, 10 megabits to 100 gigabits. You see, it's a 10 times more than UTP. Distance, so LAN is formed by UTP because the distance inside the building, inside the room, inside the, the floor, it's not, it's limited, it's not too long. So rel relatively short, it's from one to a hundred meters. Comparing with the fiber optic is up to 100,000 meters, yes, 100,000 meters. Immune to M um, EMI and RFI, it's low by UTP cabling and is high to fiber optics. Fiber optics is not affected by those distortions. Immune to electrical hazard, again, the fiber optic is high immune to this electrical hazard and only because the source of the uh, carrier of the data is light pulse. Media connection costs the lowest, but the fiber uh, fiber optic cables are very high cost. They have a very high cost. Wireless media, properties of the wireless media, as you know, is the coverage and speed. So coverage and speed. Coverage is the effective coverage get, can be significantly impacted by the physical characteristic of the deployment location, which means if you have a wireless, it's always you must know where you're providing that wireless. Is there any building surrounded or uh, the concrete is basically absorbing the radio waves and they are um, lowering the signal and degradating the signal. Types of media for the types of wireless media. So we have a standards of wireless media and these standards is called 802.11. Of course, the different um, uh, variation of these standards, we know it as Wi-Fi A, B, G, N, A, C, A, X, or the latest abbreviation is a Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6. Okay, wireless access point is very important to know. It's a concentrate wireless signals from user and connect to the existing copper-based network infrastructure. So somewhere in the building to have a wireless access, you, you are placing an access point. Whenever a user it connects to that access point, the access point is connected to the current wired copper cable network. That's it for this subject. We'll see shortly to start another one. Thank you. duplex and speed testing we're going to talk about some issue that might occur in the cables and switches during the communication we talk about half duplex and full duplex and as you already know and uh, we i mentioned it before half duplex is when one computer sends and another computer waits to receive okay so it cannot be simultaneous transmission sending and receiving full duplex from other hand is the opposite so two of the most basic settings and this is applied to every network card to every network port we have a port on the switches we have a ports on the routers and we have a network ports on our computers which are network interface cards right rg45 ports so those ports, they are working on full duplex and half duplex. So two of the most basic settings on the switch are the bandwidth or we call it speed because it depends how long, uh, how big is the bandwidth 
and how big is the formation we can put through for the certain time of period is the bandwidth, but that's how we measure actually our speed. And duplex settings for each individual switch port. On the switch we have um, ports, which are networking ports, and those ports, any switch can have a maximum 48 ports. It is critical that duplex and bandwidth settings match between the switch port and connecting devices. So computers are connected to the switches and devices connected are to the switches in order to form a LAN. So port on the switch and port on the computer, they must use the same communication channels. For example, two channels or two types of duplexing, full duplex and half duplex, and both devices must have used the same. If switch is using full duplex, then end device must use also a full duplex. If switch is using half duplex, then end device is using a half duplex. This is just an example. Switch are working on full duplex. But to have a negotiation communication, both are must use the same duplexing. So that's why the networks, they are having the auto negotiation is an optional function found in the most Ethernet switches and NICs. NICs is a network interface code. It enables two devices to automatically negotiate the best speed and duplex capabilities. Okay. Duplex and speed settings. So duplex mismatch is one of the most common causes of performance issue on 1000 megabits. 1000 megabits in this your network card is allowing to accept 10 up to 100 megabits speed of the bandwidth. It occurs when one port on the link operates at half duplex while the other port on the link it operates in the full duplex. That's why I just mentioned before. We should not allow that. Both ports must have the same duplexing. This can occur when one or both ports on the link are reset and they are returning back into the default stage. If for one network adapter the default stage is the half duplex, then after the reset it's going to turn back into the half duplex. So before you start using the communication channel between both devices, you must ensure that they are using the same duplexing site. And the auto-negotiation process does not result in both link partners having the same configuration. So you just need to do it manually. It also can occur when the user reconfigure one side of the link and forget to reconfigure the another side of the link. So basically, Everything uh, what you have to do is to check the both side are they using the same duplexing. If it's full duplex, both side must use the full duplex. If it's half, both side must use the, far, the half duplex. And sometimes after resetting the sites, you should not rely off on auto negotiation because sometimes auto negotiation won't work. So, best practice is to configure both Ethernet switch port as full duplex. So, you are configuring all switch ports as full duplex and your network card is also is configured as full duplex. And it will avoid a mismatch. This we finish with this subject and we will start very shortly with another one. Bear with me, we're gonna see each other shortly. Hello everyone, again. So, topic will be comparing TCP and UDP protocols. And this is continue our journey to successful end, taking the exam of CCI. So, transport layer. 
That's the layer where the stands are those two protocols, TCP and UDP. Rows of transport layer. Is it? It is a fourth layer of the OSI model and third layer on the TCP IP model. Here we are talking and we are having TCP IP model and transport protocol is the third layer. Is above the internet layer and beneath the application layer. All layer, as you know from the CCNA curriculum, they are communicating between each other and the things which are happening on those layer is exactly affected the transmission of the data. So transport layer is responsible for the logical communication between application itself. For example, Facebook with Facebook, Viber with Viber, WhatsApp with WhatsApp. WhatsApp cannot communicate with Viber with the same communication channel. That's why they have a different communication channel. The link between application layer and the lower layer that are responsible for the network transmission. Transport layer responsibilities, which is very important to know when you start uh, preparing yourself for the exam. The transport layer has the following responsibility. Tracking individual conversation, which means the uh, transport layer has reliable function of tracking each conversation. It's opening a session and tracking each conversation. Segmenting the data and reassembling the segment. From OSI model experience, you know that at the transport layer, it starts a process. It's called segmenting. Why this segmentation starts? Because imagine we have a different data. One data is very big, very long. The another data is very short. There's a very big conversation and very short letter. And all those data, they are carrying in different way because bigger data it's going to be much slower than a smaller data will be much faster. To prevent these differences from transmitting the data over the network, uh, the OSI model at the transport layer is start process called segmentation. So it means it's dividing a data into a smaller equal of size pieces. And each piece it has been added a sequence number, so it's called sequencing. Also, uh, the piece and every header add uh, every layer add its own header with its own information. So, transport layer add a header with its own information. Internet layer add header with its own information. Data link add a header with its own information, and etc. Basically, every header uses the segmentation and multiplexing to enable different communication conversation to be interleaved on the same network. The transport protocol layer is this one, and again, is the third one from the TCP IP model. What protocols we have in there? In the transport layer, we have a two protocols which are carry this transportation. It's a TCP and UDP protocol, transmission control protocol and user datagram protocol. As you can see here on the picture, the above layer also has a protocol and the bottom layer has also protocol, which means that every single layer of the TCP IP model or the OSI model, they have their own meaning to work and they have their own protocols. At the application layer, we have, as for the example in the picture, is FTP, HTTP, SMTP, DNS, FTP, and many, 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 many others. <coughs> Sorry. So, what does it mean that? It means that 
application layer is exactly connected to the application itself and their protocols which makes the application work. For example, HTTP or web browsing, it's handled by HTTP protocol, application protocol. File transferring is handled by file transfer protocol, application protocol, SMTP protocol is handling uh, sending emails and this is also an application protocol. DNS domain name system which is resolving names vice versa IP addresses is handled by DNS protocol and etc. Usually the protocols, the application protocols are well known and there is a uh, around 1024 well-known port numbers and their assigned protocols. Here are the bottom layer, TCP and UDP. Let's talk about those two protocols and compare them. Transmission Control Protocol. Transmission Control Protocol provides reliability and flow control. It's very important here to, to see that uh, this is the major difference between those two protocols and every each of them is using in different way and by different services. The major function of the TCP is to provide reliability and flow control. TCP basic operations is number and track data segment transmitted to a specific host from a specific application. Specific host from a specific application, track, which means Facebook to Facebook, WhatsApp to WhatsApp, specific application to a specific application. It's tracking that it must be negotiated between them to use the same application to establish a channel of communication. Acknowledge receive data. What it means that whenever you send something, the TCB ensure the data will be delivered at the destination point. If it's not, that the TCP will ask the sender send again the missing data or the missing piece of the data. Because as you know, and remember from the five minutes ago, we talked that at the transport layer there is another process which start called segmentation. Segmentation is dividing the data on small equal parts. Continuing, retransmit any acknowledged da uh, data after a certain amount of time. That's exactly what I said. When the destination provides the acknowledgement to the source, hey, certain data with the sequence number this and this is missing, Please send me again. Then the source is a blush to send it again these numbers, these sequence numbers. Sequencing data that might arrive in a wrong order. That means that whatever data has been sent through, uh, through the media and goes across the globe in a different ways, it will arrive in a different order at the destination point. But this doesn't mean it will not be reassembled. The TCP IP, the TCP protocol, it will reassemble the data in the correct order how it's sent. So send the data at an efficient rate that's acceptable by a receiver. We, call, uh, we talk about that, about the full duplex and half duplex. That must be auto-negotiation in order to establish the communication channel. User datagram, another important protocol in the transport layer, is their UDP and it provides the basic function for delivering datagrams between the appropriate application and here look carefully for with very little overhead and data checking, very little overhead and data checking, which basically means there is no reliability. This product protocol is not reliable. There is no acknowledgement. There is no checking. Is the right order 
the user datagrams arrive or is not the right order, they arrive at the destination point or there is maybe some sequencing number is missing? No. That means no reliability. So UDP is called connectionless protocol. TCP is called connection, also connection oriented. So UDP is known as a best effort. Why? Because it's very fast protocol. Very fast. Why? Because there is no acknowledgement process. There is no double checking process to check if the uh, sequencing uh, number of the se certain pieces arrive at the destination point or not and then the destination point if there is some missing part will ask the source to re-establish uh, so resend the data UDP doesn't have this that's why this missing part it makes this protocol much faster what are the services that are using this protocol we'll see right away so, UDP, because it's a faster protocol, low overhead, does not require my acknowledgement, does not resend the lost data, delivers the data as it arrives, without reassembling. And this is the protocol which call best effort. Uh, the services that are using this protocol is gaming, uh, video calling, so like streaming, services, they don't need acknowledgement. If the data has been sent, that's it. If it's arrived, arrived. If it's not, that's it. That's why these services, they don't need acknowledgement. Also, Skype communication, call communication. I'm not talking about uh, texting. I'm only talking about the voice communication. Skype, Viber, WhatsApp, Facebook, Messenger, but only voice communication. The TCP, from the other hand, is a reliable acknowledge the data, it means it checks if the old data arrived, then resends the lost data, delivers data in sequence order, and the reliable services are web browsing, emails, for example, web browsing. Have you ever sees whenever you type on the browser google.com and you receive just the 25% of the Google page? Never. Either you receive the full page of google.com, either you receive nothing and you receive error. The, the page cannot be displayed. That means you're receiving something, but not just a partial. The same for, uh, for email. You send an email to the to the destination. The destination receives just 25% of the email, but not the entire email. There is no possible. Either entire email, either nothing. Error message. That's how we know that data is well provided. So TCP overview. TCP features. Establish a session. TCP is connection oriented protocol that negotiates and establish a permanent collection or we call it also session between source and destination devices prior to forwarding any traffic so whenever application open the channels it's established the session TCP and keep established until the destination don't receive the all information from the source when the destination acknowledged that whole data arrived, then the session has been terminated. Next, ensure reliable delivery. For many reasons, it is possible for a segment to become corrupted or lost completely. Many reasons for that. Loose cable, cut cable, broken device or something. So, the packets can uh, the data can be corrupted or even uh, completely scrapped as it's transmitted over the network. So TCP ensures that each segment that it sends by the source arrives at the destination. If those data has been scrapped or lost, the source will send it again. Provides the same order delivery. It means 
by the destination point, the TCP checks the sequencing order. If it's scrambled because they arrive in different time, the TCP reorder the sequence number and make them in correct order. Then the last one is supports flow control. Network hosts have limited resources. When TCP is aware that these resources are overtaxed, it can request that sending application reduce the rate of data flow. So auto negotiation always must be the same. That's why TCP is keeping and looking for the best communication channel. And if it changes, it asks both sides to change their communication channel. Application that use TCP. We already talked about web browsing, file transfer protocol, when you're uh, sharing files with each other using a file servers. SMTP, which is uh, the protocol which is carrying out for sending emails. SSH is secure shell. If you want to uh, connect to certain devices using a secure telnet, and in this case is SSH. And these application protocols are or application are using a TCP as a carrier, as a transportation. UDP. TCP, we finish. Now it's time for UDP overview. UDP features. UDP features including following. Data is reconstructed in the order that it's received, which means if it's received in the wrong order, that's how it's reconstructed. Any segments that are lost, they are not resent again. Because again, the UDP doesn't have an acknowledgement and it's not reliable protocol. There is no session establishment. There is no session establishment at all. It's not like TCP which establishes session and keeps and tracks the application. And the sending is not informed about resource availability, which means the sender just send the data without ensuring that the receiver is available to receive it. Application that use UDP. Here in this section, we know that applications are not reliable. And what are those applications? Are DHCP, DNS, SNMP protocols, TFTP protocols, voice over IP, video conferencing. All these protocols are using UDP protocol as a transportation. Port numbers. It's very important that every communication channel has a port of communication. It's like a door. If you enter certain building, you have to open the door. Then if you want to exit, you have to exit through certain door. The computer communication is absolutely the same. So we have an outgoing port and incoming port. So let's take a look. In the communication, always there is a two parties, destination and source. Destination port and source port. The socket pairs. The source and destination port are placed within a segment. And every time depends either you're sending or receiving uh, communication, the port could be different. So here, the source and destination port are placed within a segment. The segments are then encapsulated within a packet. The combination of the source IP address and the source port number or the destination IP address and destination port number is known as a socket. Socket enable multiple processes running on the client to distinguish themselves from each other and multiple connections 
server process to be distinguished from each other. But what most So continuing with the source port numbers and destination port numbers, there is a various of number of those ports. Let's take a look. Port numbers group. Totally, we have around 65,000 port. From those 65,000, around 1,024 ports are well-known ports and they are predefined, which means yeah, they are not changing. Each application has its own port for communication. So each application. What we have to do, because 1024 is not possible to memorize it, we have to memorize it around 30, 40 ports, which are oftenly used. For example, Port 20, 21, 22, 23, and etc. But what are the information behind those ports? Port 20 and 21, it's a file transfer protocol application which is transferring files. Port 22, it's a secure shell, SSH. Port 23, it's a townnet. Port 25 is a POP tree, it's an incoming mail protocol. For port 53, it's a DNS, Domain Name Service. One more thing. Some application they're using both protocols, UDP and TCP. So DNS is one of those protocols who are using TCP and UDP protocols. 67, DHCP has 68 as well. 69, TFTP protocol. 80 is well known as web browsing port number. It's a HTTP. And 110, it's a POP tree. And 143 is a IMAP protocol. As you can see, those protocols are already predefined. What you have to do is just memorize around 3040. They are most used protocols ever. How to troubleshoot? We have a various tools of troubleshooting and uh, we have a various commands. To troubleshoot, we use certain commands. One of these commands is called netstat. So netstat command is basically is helping us to see what communication channels has been established in our computers. And how to do that? By using that command netstat. When you type netstat, it's going to give you the whole list of all establishing the port communication channels, along with the destination IP address, source IP address, the, uh, the protocol type of communication, and port number. As you can see on the pictures here below, we having a protocol communication is a TCP, then followed by IP address of the source, followed by double column, and the port number outgoing port number of communication then followed by incoming or destination with incoming port number of application so here at this record we have a, this IP address which is the destination IP address with double column followed by the incoming port number which means this is a web request to this IP address HTTP is the application protocol for web browsing. TCP communication processes. Three-way handshake. So function of three-way handshake, it's important that on the exam you might have this question to arise, so you have to be prepared. Three-way handshake. The function of the three-way handshake is few things. First, establish the destination device is present on the network. It means it's alive, it's there, so you can send the information. It verifies that destination device has an active service and it's accepting requests on the destination port number that initiate the client intends to use. So it means if you want to send the HTTP request, if you want to use the web browsing, 
The destination must ensure that this service is running and port number HTTP port number 80 it's open and it's used. It informed the destination device that the source client intends to establish a communication session on that port number. So it's establishing the session and keeps the track of the application and session. Reliability and flow control. TCP, as we already uh, mentioned several times, and you must remember that, it's very important, reliability. TCP is a reliable protocol. TCP can also help maintain the flow of packets so the device do not become overwhelmed. There may be times when TCP segments do not arrive at their destination or arrive out of order, but TCP helps to correct them. It can reassemble the packets, and if certain packets is not arrived, the sequencing number is not arrived, it will ask the source to send it again. U UDP communication its a low overhead versus reliability. It means faster but not reliable. UDP data RAM reassemble. So UDP does not track sequencing number the way TCP. We already talked about it, but you must remember the UDP is the fast, low overhead, and not reliable protocol. UDP has no way to reorder the datagrams into their transmission order. If they receive in wrong order, they're going to be constructed in that order. It's no, it's no possible way of tracking the order of sequence. And that's it with the comparing TCP protocol and UDP. We will see each other soon with the next topic. Thank you. Now I'm about to show you a videos about the TCP and UDP comparison in visual site. So visually you could better understand and prepare yourself for the exam. There will be one video, uh, just an uh, example of some question, so you may train yourself. So enjoy the video and we'll see each other very soon. We've talked about the OSI and TCP IP models. Now we're going to focus on two of the protocols in the transport layer. These are TCP and UDP. We're going to see how they get information from one application to another and their different approaches to their job rely on IP to deliver information between each other. This happens at layer 3, which may include routing packets across several networks. At layer 4 though, we see very different behaviour. The transport layer doesn't care too much about the networks in between. Why? It doesn't need to. That's layer 3's job. It also doesn't care too much about the devices themselves. Instead, it cares more about getting data between applications. The two protocols that are responsible for this are TCP and UDP. They share a few things in common. For example, they both have headers and they both have port numbers. But as you can see in the headers, there's a lot more going on with TCP than UDP. That's because TCP supports a lot of features, while UDP is extremely lightweight. Through the rest of this video, we're going to see how TCP and UDP have different approaches to getting the job done and why some applications will use one protocol or the other. In the header, you will see fields for the source and destination ports. The ports are used to identify the applications on each device. In this way, ports are like addresses for applications. This is similar to how the devices themselves have IP addresses. When an application starts a conversation, it chooses a protocol to use, as well as a random source port. This is some value from 1024 to 65535. The exact number is generally not too important. The important part is that this port number is not already in use on the device. One port number cannot be given to more than one process at a time. The destination port number, that is the port number of the server application, 
is usually a well-known value. For example, if we were using HTTP for web browsing, the port will normally be port 80. Well-known ports are in the 0 to 1023 range. By making a port well-known, it's easy for the client to guess what port the destination application will use. If you want to see some well-known ports, have a look at the list in this URL. Of course, a server application could be configured to use a non-standard port, maybe port 81 for HTTP, for example. And this is fine, but the client can't guess the port number anymore. The client application will need to be manually configured to support this. Using different ports gives us a really useful feature called multiplexing. Multiplexing is a way for one host to have several applications accessing the network at once. They all share the one network card, the one network stack, the one IP address, but they each use different ports. Think of our client over here on the left. It already has a web browser open with a connection to a web server. Now it opens a mail client and is able to send and receive mail. Both applications can access the network at the same time. But when data arrives at this device, how does it know which application it belongs to? The IP and the MAC address are the same, so they won't help. Yeah, you guessed it. The two applications use different port numbers. A network application uses a concept called a socket. The exact definition of what a socket is will vary a little, but most agree that it is made up of a local IP address, a local port number, and a protocol. The protocol being either TCP or UDP. As port numbers are unique, so are sockets. Therefore, a socket can identify which application the network data belongs to. That's fairly straightforward so far, but it gets more interesting. A single application, like our web server software over here, can also access the network many times at once. But as this is only one application, it only has one port and one IP. The socket details are the same for all incoming connections. So how can it tell one from the other? It needs to look at the combination of the local socket information and the remote socket information. It can find all of this in the layer 3 and layer 4 headers. It now has five pieces of information, the local IP, the local port, the remote IP, the remote port, and the protocol. This combination of details is often called the five tuple. Each conversation is now truly unique. Let's have a quick look at this on a workstation. I'm using Windows here, but Linux, Mac, and other devices all use the same principles. Here we have a list of processes. Each process has a process ID, shown here in the PID column. These processes all make up applications. Some applications have one process, while others, like Chrome, have several. Some of these processes will be accessing the network. That means they'll have either a TCP or a UDP port assigned. And we can find this from the command line with the command netstat using the ANO flags. A shows all connections, N shows IP addresses instead of host names, and O shows the process ID that owns the connection. Looking at these processes, we can see whether they're using TCP or UDP, the local IP address and port number, the remote IP and port, the state that the connection is in, and the process number, which we can match up on the list we looked at earlier. Everything we've seen so far has been common to both TCP and UDP. But as you can see from the headers, they're quite different. This is because UDP was assigned to be very lightweight, while TCP was designed with a lot of extra features. For example, TCP is connection-oriented, while UDP is connectionless. Connection-oriented means that TCP will build and track a connection between applications on a pair of hosts before sending data. When they're done, TCP will close this connection. This stateful connection enables more features, like error recovery and flow control. There's a lot to understand around TCP connections, so we'll use the next video to go into those in detail. UDP, on the other hand, doesn't try to build a connection. It just starts sending data without worrying about any of those details. TCP and UDP also have very different feelings on what to do about errors. UDP, for one, doesn't care about errors. If a packet or segment goes missing, UDP doesn't worry, it just moves on to the next piece of data. 
TCP, though, does care about lost data. The receiver must acknowledge that all the data that it has received, and if data is lost, TCP will manage the retransmission. Because of this, TCP is known as reliable, while UDP is known as unreliable. This also leads into a TCP feature called windowing. This is where both sides of the conversation agree on how much data can be sent at once before requiring the receiver to acknowledge it. This value is called the window size. If there is no data loss, the window size can dynamically grow. If there is data loss, the window size will dynamically shrink. I'm not going to go into much detail on error recovery and windowing right now, because they've got their own video coming up very soon. The final difference I want to mention at this point is ordered data transfer. TCP uses sequence numbers in the header to track the order that segments should be processed in. This may be critical for some applications, but it does add extra overhead in processing time. This is not important for other applications, which may be why they use UDP. UDP does not care about the order the data is in. You may be wondering what UDP is even used for, as it seems to lack some critical features. After all, there's no error recovery. Isn't that quite important? It may sound silly to give up features like that, but there are some cases where this helps. Think about real-time applications like voice and video streaming. Imagine that one person on the phone call has network problems and a few seconds of data go missing. If TCP was being used here, this would be noticed and the missing data would need to be resent. While this is happening, the phone call is still going on. Now one of our calls is lagging behind. Do you see how that could be a problem? So instead, voice traffic uses UDP. If some data is lost, there are no retransmissions. They just move on and continue the rest of the phone call. So you can see that TCP and UDP are used for different purposes. UDP is lightweight, it has smaller headers, no retransmissions, and no flow control. It's great for real-time applications like voice or video, or for applications that manage these features themselves, like DNS, which we'll talk about some other time. TCP, on the other hand, has a full feature set for applications that would rather leave these details up to the network stack. Next video will give you the comparison between TCP and UDP. Enjoy! In this video, we'll cover the two major transport protocols, UDP and TCP. Before we do that though, let's talk about transport protocols in general to understand why we need them in the first place. On the internet, every network packet follows this five layer structure. We have the application layer, the transport layer, the network layer, the link layer, and the physical layer. I might do a full video on this five layer structure at some point, but for now just remember that UDP and TCP are part of the transport layer. Have you ever wondered why it's possible that two applications can use the same internet connection at the same time? Well, that's because of what the transport layer provides. It allows multiple applications to use one network connection simultaneously. Much like street names have house numbers, the transport layer creates about 65,000 ports on your computer per network connection. These ports can be reserved and used by applications on your computer, and one application can use multiple ports at the same time if it wants. Let's say that an application reserved port 12437 to send a message to port 80 on some other machine. Whenever the application layer creates a message, it is passed on to the transport layer. On this layer, we wrap the message inside what we call a segment. This segment contains some additional information like the source port as well as the destination port. Then, when the segment is created, it is passed on to the network layer for further processing. Our segment will show up on the receiver side when it is passed on from its network layer to the transport layer. The segment will be examined to determine the destination port and then the message is unwrapped and delivered to port 80. So that's the general idea of the transport layer, but there's more to it than that. We have two major transport protocols, UDP and TCP, and they both have their own characteristics. Let's look at UDP first. 
One of the biggest advantages of UDP is that its packet sizes are smaller than TCP, about 60% even. UDP headers are 8 bytes and TCP headers are 20 bytes, so that's a big difference. UDP is connectionless. This means that you don't have to create a connection first before sending out data. And finally, you have more control over when data is being sent out. Now, I do realize that this may sound a little vague to you, but once we get TCP into the mix, this will become clearer. Because data corruption is a common occurrence on the internet, UDP has a primitive form of error detection. Its packets carry a 16-bit checksum, but it is not that reliable. When UDP does detect corruption, it will not try to recover from it. In most cases, the corrupted segment will just be discarded. In some cases, it will keep the corrupted segment, but turn on a warning flag for the application. UDP does not attempt to compensate for lost packets. Every packet gets sent out once. If it gets dropped on its way to the receiver, tough luck, it's gone. UDP does not guarantee in-order packet delivery. Packets won't necessarily arrive in the application in the order that they were sent. There's no congestion control in UDP. Even if your network's really busy, UDP will just try to cram those packets in there. This is usually a bad strategy, because on a congested network, packets get dropped more often. In conclusion, UDP may be lightweight, but it's not that reliable. This is where TCP comes in. The transmission control protocol has certain features that make it more reliable than UDP. However, it also has a bigger communication overhead than UDP. Since TCP is connection-based, we have to negotiate a connection first before we can do anything. This procedure is known as a three-way handshake. First, the initiator will ask the acceptor if it wants to set up a connection. The acceptor will reply to this request, and when the initiator receives this reply, it will send a packet to the acceptor that acknowledges that the connection has now been established. A similar song and dance takes place when they close down a connection. Now that we have this connection, we can implement all kinds of nice features like delivery acknowledgements. When data gets sent from one host to another, the receiver will acknowledge that it got that data. This is one of the reasons why TCP segments carry a number. Another feature that TCP offers is retransmission. When a sender doesn't get a delivery acknowledgement within a certain amount of time, it will assume that the packet got lost on its way, so it will send it again. Because segments are numbered in TCP, it can also implement in-order delivery. Although packets may still arrive out of order, TCP will rearrange them before sending them to the application. Other TCP enhancements include congestion control. This feature will delay transmission of data when the network is congested. It eases the strain on the network and it helps minimize packet loss. TCP enforces a small change to error detection. While there is no technical improvement of the error detection feature, the checksum has now been made mandatory for IPv4 as well as IPv6. For UDP segments, the checksum is only mandatory for IPv6 packets. Let's look at the downsides of using TCP. TCP segments need bigger headers than UDP segments. As you may remember, UDP headers are about 60% smaller than TCP headers. A side effect of TCP's congestion control mechanism is that data doesn't always get sent out immediately. This is of course done on purpose to ease network congestion, but sometimes that's not what you want. Take Skype for example. When you're making a voice call, you kinda want it to feel like a real-time conversation, right? Well, what TCP's congestion control does is when the network is congested, it deliberately introduces latency, so your real-time conversation will not feel as real-time as you want it to be. As you can see, congestion control can be either a nuisance or an enhancement. It all depends on the context, really. 
Finally, TCP has a bigger overhead. All those retransmissions and packet acknowledgements and all that jazz, well, that's overhead. Sometimes you don't want every packet to arrive. Sure, you want packets to arrive, but if certain packets drop out, you don't care that much. For example, to stream HD video, you need lots of bandwidth, but if you use TCP for it, you need even more, because you have to send around acknowledgements, you have to do retransmissions, and besides, video streaming can deal with a certain amount of packet loss. They have ways to compensate for that. In this case, it makes more sense to use UDP than TCP. Both protocols are also different on a conceptual level. We call UDP message-oriented, which means that applications send their data in distinct chunks. Think of it as snail mail, email, or text messaging. Now TCP, on the other hand, is stream-oriented. It is used as a continuous flow of data. Under TCP, your application does not choose how data is sliced into packets. Just let it know whenever anything needs to be sent, and then TCP will slice that into packets and recompose everything on the other end. It could use lots of small packets, but it could also choose to go with few big packets. It just picks whatever works best at that time. Rest assured though, you don't have to worry about how the packets are sliced. All you need to know is that on the receiver end, everything gets recomposed into a stream that you can read from. So which one's better, UDP or TCP? It all depends on the type of application that you're building. Let's look at text communication. Performance-wise, this isn't a big challenge, because you don't need a lot of bandwidth to send some text around after all. Under TCP, everything will work fine. With UDP, however, you could get text in the wrong order, or text could get lost along the way. There's no guarantee anything could go wrong there, because UDP doesn't do retransmissions, and it doesn't guarantee in-order delivery. When it comes to text communication, TCP clearly takes the cake. Now, I don't know about you, but when I download files off the internet, I'd like to have all the parts, including the chunks that didn't make it through the first time. TCP offers retransmission, UDP does not. We're also going to need in-order delivery, because seriously, what good is a scrambled JPEG? For similar reasons, remote access protocols like SSH also use TCP. If you need delivery acknowledgements, UDP isn't gonna do you any good. If you insist on using UDP, you could implement some sort of acknowledgement system in your application layer for important packets, but most of the time it's not worth the hassle. With multimedia streaming, things are a little more ambiguous. It could either be UDP or TCP. Traditionally, people have chosen UDP because it has less overhead, it doesn't do that congestion control thing that introduces latency, and we can compensate for a certain percentage of lost packets. More recently, people have started to use TCP for multimedia streaming. If the bandwidth is there, you might as well enjoy the benefits that TCP brings. Also, some firewalls block UDP altogether for security reasons and then you're forced to use TCP. UDP can also be used for small question and answer transactions, such as DNS lookups. The main benefit here is that you don't have the overhead of creating and closing a connection every time you need something. As is the case with multimedia streaming, bandwidth-intensive apps that can tolerate some amount of packet loss usually go with UDP. The last video will give you a few questions to think about it with their answers. This will prepare you much better to the future exam. Enjoy the last video. Thank you and we will see each other soon. Bear with me.